which has just come out, and you have all read at least one chapter of from uh, from the reading. Well, you you read the the Ur version right. of that chapter, not the real. That's right. Um, and so, without any further ado, Philip Oslander. Thank you. <laughs> I'm here all day. Don't forget to tip your server. Um, I have some business cards I just like to distribute. I have these cards. I never use them, so <laughs> let's spread them around. Not that I'm so hard to find. Um, so it's a great honor and privilege for me to be here with you today. Um, I think that if, if there are no particular objections, um, the way I'd like to kind of organize this is I have about 45 minutes worth of stuff to say here, okay, with nothing on the screen, <laughs> just me. Um, and so I'd like to do that, and then between that and lunch, um, maybe we could focus our discussion around whatever I say here. <laughs> and then after lunch, maybe we could focus the discussion more on the reading materials. If you're amenable, there's a lot of overlap between these two things. So it's not; these are not really discrete propositions, uh, but just as a general way of organizing things. So um, I don't remember exactly when David approached me about doing this. It seems like it was a long time ago, but whenever it was, uh, I think it was I. It might have been him who suggested that this presentation be called "Liveness Revisited," and then <laughs> I was here in April. Uh, to give a couple of talks, one for the theater department, and when we were at lunch afterward, David said to me, well, it doesn't seem like you've changed your mind about anything. Uh, and so the idea of revisiting is a little bit of a hoax here. <laughs> um, uh, because he's right, basically. Uh, fundamentally, in terms of, ah, oh, thank you so much. In terms of the ideas, especially about liveness, uh, that, you know, I published originally in 1999 and then again in 2008 in the revised uh, second edition. Um, and On the other hand, my earlier work. Um, and, and one I'm happy to talk more about this later on if you're interested. Um, uh, but uh, one very specific thing that I just realized uh, this morning, because I actually, uh, I said this at dinner last night, I don't remember the stuff that I write. Okay, so I actually have to go back and reread it. Uh, so I did. Uh, I went back and reread the same portion of liveness that I asked you to read. Uh, and I, I realized there, I saw again there this section where. Um, I reject the idea of writing as a way of recording performances. Okay? Um, I don't believe that anymore. Right? And in fact, in this new book, <laughs> there's a fairly long discussion of writing as a, a form of performance documentation. And almost a kind of, I don't know what the right word is, but sort of reminder in a way that we become so obsessed, I think, in the context of performance documentation with the idea that documentation is an audiovisual phenomenon that we've sort of forgotten that writing also is a way of capturing performances. And one of the people that I talk extensively about in the book, Michael Kirby, really found that to be the primary way uh, of recording performances. So, okay, so that's a very specific thing that I have changed my mind about. But apart from that, I really haven't changed my mind about anything fundamental, I don't think. And certainly for me, liveness has become a sort of paradigmatic concept uh, in my own work. And as Thomas Kuhn suggests in The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, the work I've been doing through two editions of this book and other stuff constitutes what he calls normal science, devoted to ironing out, extending, and refining the paradigm rather than to uncovering anomalies that might ultimately discredit it. And you will see that running throughout this entire presentation is a lot of discussion of sort of mid-century, mid-20th century, uh, intellectual figures like Kuhn, Goffman, and Gadamer. And for some reason, I seem to have a very strong affinity uh, for what was going on uh, philosophically, theoretically, whatever, uh, during that, that time. 
So another thing that David mentioned to me over lunch in April was that, uh, is that you know, deeply embedded in my approach to this paradigmatic concept of liveness is the Derridian gesture of deconstruction, of relentlessly questioning seeming binary oppositions with the purpose of revealing the terms to be interdependent in ways that reverse and undermine traditional hierarchies. For example, defining the differences between live and technologically mediated performance in terms of the traditional opposition becomes less tenable the more aspects of the question one considers. Speaking of attending the theater, the playwright and actor Wallace Shawn has said, I will not attempt to do Wallace Shawn, uh, although that would be kind of fun. Wouldn't it? Um, I've been spoiled like a lot of people by watching movies and television where you can see very well and you can hear what the actors are saying. It's really, really hard for me to sit in row HH and not be able to see the faces of the actors and to have to either strain to hear their voices or listen to projected voices, which I know are grotesquely unnatural and which make it absolutely impossible for me to take the whole thing seriously. The situation Sean describes is not at all unusual. It is something anyone who attends a live event of any kind, a theatrical performance, a concert, a sports event, a political rally, and so on, may encounter. Under these circumstances, what becomes of the immediacy, the chemistry, the sense of direct personal context said to define the experience of live performance? As Sean suggests, this experience is not at all unmediated. In the case he describes, and by I use the words mediated and mediatized, they don't mean exactly the same thing. Mediated is a much broader concept, as you're about, as you're about to see. Um, mediatized refers much more specifically to media technologies. Um, as Sean suggests, this experience is not at all unmediated. In the case he describes, it is mediated both by the physical characteristics of the performance space, which can either enhance or undo the potential for contact between performer and spectator, and by his own experience as a film and television viewer. So this is something that I, I have noticed <laughs> is very important to me in, in almost everything that I write is the idea that the way we as audiences perceive performances is conditioned by the environment of media technology, right? Uh, and I further have believed since the writing of, of the first edition of Liveness that this creates certain expectations as to the experience of spectatorship that we carry with us into all such situations, right? which is exactly what Wallace Shawn is talking about here. Right, that his perception as an audience member is conditioned by watching television and film. When he goes to the theater, he still has those expectations in place. Right? And he's perceiving what's happening in the live performance through those expectations. Um, Sean also implies that the sense of intimacy and immediacy can actually be stronger when watching film or television than at the theater for the reasons that he mentions. You can see the actors' faces, you can actually hear their voices, etc. In other words, we cannot treat the qualities traditionally assigned to live performance that punitively differentiate it from technologically mediated performance as inherent or ontological characteristics. They are phenomenological as opposed to ontological in the sense that they are not characteristics of the performance itself but things experienced and felt by performers and spectators. One cannot say, for example, that a performance in a small space is necessarily more intimate than a performance in a huge space. It is only so if the participants experience it that way. And there may be forms of mediation taking place. Uh-oh, the pages have stuck together. <laughs> what could be on the next page? <laughs> oh, all right. Forms of mediation taking place that either encourage or discourage participants from having the experience. For example, as Maria Navarro observed in an article in the New York Times on the subject of famous rock musicians who sometimes play concerts for relatively small audiences at high prices, she says, intimate is, of course, relative. If the performer usually plays to audiences of 20,000, a concert for 2,000 would be downright chummy. <laughs> The experience of intimacy in such a case is indeed relative. It results as much from the participant's knowledge and experience of the artist's normal practice as from the circumstances of the performance. I can also recount an experience as a 
concert goer that I had myself many years ago. When I mention the names of the artists, you'll know how many years ago. Uh, but sometime in the 1970s, I went to see a concert by Jethro Tull at uh, Boston Garden, the sports arena. And uh, um, the opening act was Livingston Taylor, James Taylor's brother, right? also a musician. Actually, all of James Taylor's siblings are musicians, or were. Um, so first of all, this was completely incongruous to have this, this basically you know, folky singer-songwriter, solo performer opening for Jethro Tull, one of the loudest rock bands in the world at the time. Um, and he was performing all by himself. So he's in the middle of the Boston Garden with you know, however many thousands of Jethro Tull fans all around him in a spotlight in the middle, right, with him and his banjo. <laughs> and, but the thing is, it worked. It was amazing. I mean, he somehow knew how to hold a crowd of that size under that, those circumstances. And I have been to other performances where the opening act was not so fortunate. Right? But he did it. And he, even though it was an enormous space, and he was really far away from anybody, right, this tiny little figure down there, he somehow managed to create a sense of intimacy with that audience. So as another point that, you know, it's a very large point that certainly cuts through everything I do, context is everything, right? Everything is context specific in, in the intellectual world I live in. So in Liveness, the book, I brought my deconstructive outlook to bear on the opposition between live and recorded or mediatized or documented performances by suggesting that the live does not precede the recording. It is generally supposed that a recording is a recording of something, and that the something in question is a live event that existed prior to being captured by the recording. In the book, I suggest that the live did not exist as a conceptual or perceptual category before recording media came into being because the concept live is meaningful only in relation to its opposite. There's no purpose in distinguishing an event as live when there is no other way it could be experienced. This notion is encapsulated in the sentence in the book that probably has provoked more strong reactions than any other single thing I've ever written, which is, the ancient Greek theater was not live because there was no way of recording it. In this sense, the live is produced by the recorded or the mediatized. It does not precede it. I further argue that in our current cultural economy, live events are frequently modeled on mediatized ones or mediatized versions of themselves rather than the other way around. I've extended this challenge to question the privileging of a live event as the original, the original, relative to which a recording or mediatization is understood to be a copy or some other kind of secondary iteration. This argument is at the heart of my recent work on the question of performance art documentation, the subject of my new book, which I just showed you, Reactivations, Essays on Performance and its Documentation. Lovely Christmas gift. <laughs> um, there, I argue that a live performance and a documented version of the same performance are equally iterations of what the philosopher David Davies calls an artistic content. To this way of thinking, the live event and the documented one need have no intrinsic relationship to one another, though each has a connection to the same artistic ideas and vision that both <laughs> express. Therefore, the document is not best understood as a record or derivative of a live event, but as a distinct site of performance in itself, where the, an audience can experience the artistic content. This position does not discount, this is something I'm continually accused of. Yes, but looking at a document is not the same thing as going to a live performance. Can I say it? Duh. <laughs> right? And I've never, ever actually said that it is. Right? And yet somehow, continually, people think that I say that. Huh? No. So, this position does not discount the experiential differences between attending a live event and watching video documentation, for example. It simply insists that these two experiential modes offer different encounters with the same content, and that our purpose as audience for either live event or document is to experience this content. 
one way or another. Rather than seeing liveness as a stable ontological condition, I have argued repeatedly that it should be understood as a concept that is defined and continually redefined historically. A moving target whose definition and meaning change in relation to other historical changes, particularly in the technologies that mediate live performance and the alterations of audience perception and expectations that result from consuming performance primarily in recorded or mediatized forms to which Wallace Shawn attests. The development of such technologies over time has complicated both the idea of liveness and the experience of it, largely by enabling live experiences that do not depend on the physical co-presence of performer and audience. What I have come to call, actually it's not me, I borrowed this term from Nick Caldry, classic liveness, and since I mentioned the Greek theater, I should say I don't mean classic in the sense of Greek, I mean classic more like classic Coke, kind of. Um, <laughs> Uh, the classic aliveness was a relationship between performance and audience that entailed both temporal and spatial co-presence. Early in the 20th century, broadcast technologies, beginning with radio, effectively eliminated the need for spatial co-presence since audiences are perfectly prepared to accept that a performance perceived through radio, television, or an internet stream is live as long as we are assured that it is happening at the time we perceive it. I call this relationship broadcast liveness. As a result of the influence of broadcast technologies, temporality rather than spatiality has emerged as the primary dimension of liveness. The arrangement at the BMW Tate Live Performance Room at Tate Modern in London dramatizes the idea that temporality has become the primary dimension of liveness. And one of your optional readings is something that I wrote for a, a book that Tate published about this, uh, this, this thing they have. Um, and the thing that's very distinctive about, and by the way, I've been told that every time I write or say this, you have to say the whole thing, including the corporate logo, <laughs> right? So it has to always be BMW Tate Live Performance Room. You can never say any part of that by itself. Um, so the arrangement at the BMW Tate Live Performance Room at Tate Modern in London, uh, I'm sorry, the performances that occur there can be experienced only through online streaming. Even though the performances take place live in a room somewhere in the museum, no audience shares the space with the performers. The audience watches either a live stream of the performance or later, an archived version of the same stream. The key point is that what differentiates the live performance from the archived one is only that one can experience it in real time as it is happening. Recently, I argue that this temporal relationship is the crucial dimension of liveness, even in cases of classic liveness that do entail physical co-presence, by building on Herbert Blau's observation that, quote, theater posits itself in distance. And I was, when I was rereading re um, this chapter, I noticed that I also I had earlier quoted a different passage from Blau where he talks about theater being founded on separation. Right? Of course, it's, that's, these are very closely related concepts. Theater posits itself in distance, by which he means the inevitable distance between performer and spectator, whether that distinction is created, quote, by the stage, edge, pit, or the space of consciousness itself, end quote. Even in conventional theater, the experience of liveness is the experience of sharing time with other people from whom one is held at a distance. As Blau suggests, this distance is not necessarily physical. It can, be distance, it can be the distance created by the social differentiation between performers and spectators. I have a tendency to spill things, so I'm keeping my water apart from my pages here. Uh, this primacy of the temporal in our current experience of liveness has also challenged the ostensible connection between liveness and aliveness in that I believe we experience or can experience all manner of things as live, even if they're not alive, as long as we believe them to be unfolding or interacting with us in real time. I've argued many times that we experience the playback of a recording of music, for example, as a performance happening for us in our own time a theme I reiterate in this new book, 
when discussing how we experience performances from documentation. One of the main purposes of this book is to arrive at a theory of how this occurs. When we chat online with a customer service representative, we experience the exchange as live, even though there's a good chance that the entity on the other end of it is not a human being, but a bot. The bot may seem live, and even alive, simply because it provides feedback. It responds to us in real time. What I have said so far already shows that there has been a shift over time in my approach to the question of liveness that can be summarized in the rubric, which I think is the title of the seminar today, from ontology toward phenomenology. And I really, I was really struck, um, uh, again, since I forget everything I write, I read my own writing as sort of an outsider. Uh, the good news is that I usually like it. Uh, without wanting to seem too egotistical, I can say that I've never actually picked up something I wrote a long time ago and read and gone, oh my god. Well, did I write that? I came close to that recently. <laughs> I recently read a piece of mine from 1983 that has never been published, and it's never going to be. <laughs> um, uh, um, but I was really struck in, in liveness at how, how, you know, this is sort of really energetic uh, critique of this kind of ontological perspective that then stops and sort of falls short of proposing an alternative to that. Um, and so that's kind of what I've been trying to do more recently um, by moving from, I mean, it's, it's, there's, a, there's certainly an irony here because my uh, accusation of the general discourse, especially around performance documentation, is that it's obsessed with the ontology of documentation. Of course, I am also. Right? I'm equally obsessed with the, the ontological understanding of liveness or, uh, or performance documentation. It's just that I reject those things. But that doesn't mean I'm not obsessed with them. Right? So I've been trying to move from that obsession toward uh, an obsession with phenomenology. Um, uh, I will also, as a side note, and just to be a little bit obnoxious, uh, I will observe that in my experience, most performance scholars who claim to be engaged with phenomenology really mean that they, I'm not going to mention any names, although there are some in one of the pieces you may have read. Mm -hmm. I will observe that in my experience, most performance scholars who claim to be engaged with phenomenology really mean that they wish to speak of the audience's experience, perspective, or interpretation. They are actually engaged with something no one ever talks about anymore uh, called reader response theory, something much more like that, than actually with phenomenology in the philosophical sense. My original research question was something like, what does it mean that something is live? I believe very strongly in research questions, by the way. Um, this question branched out in two directions, toward a consideration of the identity and properties of the experiences we understand to be live, which, as I've already said, I concluded are historical and ever-changing, rather than ontological and constant, but also toward the question of the cultural value attributed to live experience. My conclusion there was that classic liveness seemed to be diminishing in value in a cultural economy dominated by mediatization as evidenced particularly by the many ways live performances seem to model themselves now on their own mediatized versions. Uh, the, this, the same kind of list of examples that I've used many times before, such as the use of giant screens at sports stadiums and rock concerts to allow close-ups to become part of the vocabulary of the live event, or the repurposing of films as Broadway shows, or the Nashville Opera's use of an iPod-based commentary track similar to that on a DVD, during its 2006 production of Gounod's Romeo et Juliet. Both the BMW Tape Modern Live Performance Room and the various programs that currently broadcast productions of theater and opera online into theaters <coughs> offer testimony to the idea that physical proximity is no longer essential to the live presentation of the performing arts, <coughs> that they can be native to the screen despite there being forms in which the presentness of spectators and performance, performers to one another has long been considered a bedrock value. When Liveness was originally published in 1999, some readers apparently thought that I was furthering the cultural denigration of classic liveness by devaluing it myself. And I, there's a little anecdote at the start of the preface to the second edition, which is a true story, um, uh, about that. 
Um, I, I also say in that preface, I was also accused of being pessimistic. Uh, the first claim is not true. One of the main reasons I wrote the book was to try to understand why something I valued, traditional live performance, seemed to be losing its value and identity in increasingly mediatized cultural contexts. The second accusation was more accurate. I did not paint a rosy picture of the future of live forms. Even though I regret that live performance of the kind for which I trained as a young actor appreciated as a theater and concert goer, and so on, seems not to have the same cultural presence and value as it once did, I am not particularly nostalgic by nature, and I believe in facing reality head on when possible. The premise of my work on performance documentation, for instance, is that we all access performances in documented forms, and that when we do, we believe we have had an experience of the performance. I would much rather examine the implications of this reality, or what I take to be a reality, than try to argue it away by following the standard narrative, which claims that since documentation inevitably translates performance into another medium, and thus betrays the performance documented, performances and their documents are two separate things, and that the live event always offers the richer and more authentic experience. Right? My current organizing question is no longer, what does it mean that something is live, but something more like, how do we experience things as live? My nomination of real-time interaction as the core experience of liveness, more or less regardless of what one is interacting with, reflects this concern. From this perspective, liveness is not a characteristic of a performance, but a characteristic of our experience and perception of it. In fact, the liveness in question may be the liveness of our perceptual experience as it unfolds in real time, not that of the thing experienced. This idea is central to my analysis of how we experience performances from documents. I argue that performance documents do not carry us back in time to witness a performance in the past. Performance documents are not time machines in for short. Rather, they enable us to bring that same performance into our present and to experience it as immediate. My approach to this reformulated research question is rooted in both the hermeneutic phenomenology of Hans Georg Gadamer and the interaction of sociology of Irving Goffman. And one of my hobbies right now is to try to figure out how to reconcile these two figures, uh, because I do feel that there's a fair amount of common ground there, but it's really hard to explain that. <laughs> Although their respective intellectual traditions are very different, one thing these two figures have in common, it, they don't have in common, Gadamer lived to be 100 years old. You all know that, right? He lived the entirety of the 20th century, um, uh, so which is fascinating in and of itself. So that's one thing they do not have in common, since Goffman actually died relatively young. Although their respective traditions are, are very different, one thing these two figures have in common is the idea that the things we encounter in the world, including other people, make claims upon us, and that our experience is constructed through cybernetic or hermeneutic processes in which we respond to those claims and the entities making them, I'm sorry, in which we respond to those claims and the entities making them respond to our responses and so on. So another thing about that mid 20th century is cybernetics, right? Um, which is also part of the, the large intellectual history mix here. Um, both also suggest that we must frequently assume a particular stance toward the entity making the claim in order to respond to it in what Gadamer calls acts of consciousness. I was just referring to a version of this idea when I spoke a moment ago about bringing documented performances into our present and experiencing them as immediate. So the key point, if you're sort of working this idea through hermeneutic phenomenology is that this does not just happen, right? Um, it requires a particular kind of engagement with the document. This idea is also connected with Goffman's concept of the as if, a state of consciousness or information state, to use his phrase, into which we intentionally place ourselves in order to respond to the claims made upon us by an event and its framing. So, in the remainder of this presentation, I'll offer two different but related characterizations of liveness, which are moving in a different direction from the past, at least to some extent. 
liveness as a frame following Goffman, and the hermeneutics of digital liveness, which you have my reading on that. I'm just going to recapitulate a bit of that at the end, following Goddard. And along the way, I'm also, as I said, trying to figure out a way of talking about these two figures side by side. Um, so, this is pretty heavy duty stuff. At one point, I imagined myself doing empirical research into live, and I, as you, I'm sure you realize, I don't do any empirical research. <laughs> but I had this fantasy of doing empirical research into liveness as a Goffmanian frame. The hypothesis being that we experience things as live because they are framed that way. Okay? This clearly is true. For example, I discovered that one of my favorite rock albums, King Crimson, Starless, and Bible Black, is a live recording from which any sonic information that would identify it as such has been removed. In the absence of such information, I had always assumed that it is a studio recording. This, by the way, is an example of what Goffman calls frame confusion, since the people who made the album knew that it was a live recording, but I, their audience, could not because they withheld that information from me. Since I believe that there are different styles of listening, that we do not listen to live recordings in the same way we listen to studio albums, for example, it makes a difference whether I understand a recording to be live or studio production. Another example. Some years ago, while attending a conference in Boston, which is where I'm originally from, I undertook to walk, and if you know Boston geography, you'll understand what I'm talking about. I undertook to walk from Northeastern University along Mass Ave to the Public Garden. Pretty long walk. And since I don't walk that well, and actually I couldn't walk even less now than I could then, by the time I, I finally, I didn't quite make it to the Public Garden and I had to take a taxi back. Uh, along the way, I passed by the Berkeley College of Music. Um, are you all familiar with the Berkeley College of Music, the place that educates primarily jazz musicians? Um, and develop, well, it's a unique style of music that I call Berkeley fusion jazz. <laughs> um, I paused by a picket fence with a gate in it outside the college because I heard music. By opening the gate and revealing a small amphitheater in which a student group was performing, I came to understand that the music was live. Absent a live performance frame, I would no more have been able to hear that the music was live anymore than I was able to hear that Starless and Bible Black is not a studio album. For years, I understood that album to be a studio recording because it was framed that way by default. And I would not have known what I was listening to on Mass Ave had it not been framed for me as a live performance. So basically, you're on the street, you hear music, you have no idea. You can have no idea what the source of that music is. Is it someone playing a record in a dorm room somewhere with an open window? Is it actually a live band? What is it? All right, so without the frame to tell you what it is, in effect, or to tell you how to perceive it, so in that sense, liveness or live performance is a frame as much as anything else is. Right? We, we experience things as live, at least in part because they're framed that way. Our sense that if something is occurring live or not is therefore a premise, not a conclusion. This is actually obvious when you think about it, but anyhow. Um, it's a premise, not a conclusion. Something we believe to be true of a performance at the outset, rather than a characteristic revealed through the experience of it. I mean, the, the, from the Goffin point of view, what can be revealed through the experience of it is, what can happen through the experience of it is a discrediting of the idea that it was live. Um, liveness is a frame in Goffman's sense of the term, an understanding of what is going on that allows me to define my relationship to it and participate appropriately with it. It might seem that the sorts of theater and performance art events we habitually think of when we consider live performance are different from recorded music, broadcasting, or live feeds because these are arenas in which classic liveness still holds sway. The performers and audience typically are physically present to one another. This is true, but even when we are physically there, the potential for frame errors or frame confusion does not disappear. We might discover, for instance, that Millie Vanilli are not really singing, even though they're right there before us, or that the people we think are the flesh and blood black eyed peas are in fact holographic projections, or that Vito Acconci was not actually under the ramp, 
voicing his sexual fantasies during his performance of Seedbed, but had placed a tape recorder there that played back his voice. Two of these examples are real. The third presumably is not, though how could we know for sure? I bring this up not so much to sow doubt and paranoia, <laughs> or to make an ethical argument, presumably King Crimson's deceiving me into believing a live album is a studio product is what Goffman would call a benign fabrication. Millie Vanilli is arguably a less benign case. As to suggest that the liveness even of events in which performers and spectators are physically present to one another is to some extent something we simply have to accept without verification, just as it is in broadcasting or with the tape modern performance room. In other words, how do we know? that those events are really happening live when they're being streamed from the tape modern performance room. There's, there's no way of verifying that. Um, in cases where verification is possible, our belief that a performance is live may be discredited in light of information we uncover, such as Billy Vanilli are not actually singing. I made a related point in an essay titled Jazz Improvisation as a Social Arrangement. Just as the liveness of music or any other kind of performance cannot necessarily be determined by what we see and hear alone, we cannot determine whether or not ostensibly improvised performance is truly improvised in the moment. So, to write this essay, I undertook a pretty substantial, what you'd call literature review of musicological writings on improvisation, something I do not recommend to anybody. Uh, that is a thicket, my friends. Uh, so I am not going to get into how improvisation is defined, what should count as true improvisation. Uh, that's just that's a thorny question I am intentionally skirting. But we accept that parts, performances or parts of performances framed as improvisation are actually improvised without being able to verify that this is the case. One of Goffman's most powerful concepts appears in his chapter, The Theatrical Frame, in the book Frame Analysis, the concept of the as if. And of course, Goffman's not the only one to use this phrase, nevertheless. Goffman argues that performances often require us as audience to act as if we don't know something that we do know, or as if something is true when we know it not to be, or as if something is happening when we can't know that it is. Go Stage magic is the perfect example of the last one. Goffman's chief example belongs to the first category. Remember what the first category was? Of course not. <laughs> Goffman's <laughs> human memory. Goffman's chief example belongs to the first category. He claims that in order to enjoy a performance of a play with which we are familiar, we have to act as if we don't know the plot already, as if we are experiencing its unfolding for the first time. So the alternative, of course, is, you know, you're at a performance of Hamlet, and there's someone there going, yeah, they're all dead at the end, except for Horatio. Right? And the, the technical term for that person that Goffman and theorists of play use is spoil sport. <laughs> but you don't want to be that guy. Right? You don't want to be that person. I'll give you another example. This is a real thing I experienced years and years ago. Once again, back in Boston, I saw what was actually a really, really excellent production of Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, directed by Albie, with Ben Gazar and I think Colleen Dewhurst or something. It's just an amazing thing. I don't, I, I, don't, I, I don't know if it ever actually made it to Broadway. If it did, it didn't last very long. But it was really a remarkable production. So I went on a Wednesday matinee. I won't say what the cultural implications of that are. And as the lights are going down, this very loud whisper comes from the back, there is no baby. Uh. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so, the as if. Um, an example from the second category, which I don't take from Goffman, but from Christopher Small's wonderful book, Musicking. And he says, that this is supposedly, well, it is of course true, that he ascribes this to a justly famous country music performer without identifying the person. When a musician says, we're going to be here all night, well, we all know that this is not true. We're not going to be here all night. We're going to be here for a couple hours, right? Uh, but we act as if it is, cheering, stomping, and whistling in response. Goffman posits this as if, specifically in the context of the theater, though the phrase pops up elsewhere in his work, but it pertains to all forms of performance, 
and the tacit agreements that are binding on both performers and spectators. Every form of performance has its particular as ifs. All right? So for example, in jazz, all we, we behave as if all improvised solos are applause worthy. <laughs> all right? In re-examining my past work recently, I saw that the concept of verifiability I just discussed in the context of liveness and improvisation runs through it in various ways, particularly on my work on the relationships between the sonic and visual dimensions of musical performance. Philosopher Stan Godlevich's book, Musical Performance, has had a significant impact on me because I find in it so much with which to agree and so much with which to disagree, which to me is what I'm looking for. Um, one of Godlevich's concerns is creditworthiness, the conditions under which we can credit a performer for having done something. He argues that recording, for instance, deprives us of the ability to grant credit to a musician because we have no way of knowing whether the musician is actually capable of performing the music or whether the performance was pieced together in the studio and therefore does not represent the musician's actual degree of skill. Much the same can be said of performance on film. I recently watched, I'm always a few years behind everything, so I recently watched the film Whiplash, finally, about a young jazz drummer and the, shall we say, demanding teacher he encounters at a music conservatory. A film with very little bearing on reality, I have to say. And realize that it is impossible to discern, and this I was sort of watching for this as I was watching the film, because I had this in mind, it's impossible to discern how much drumming the actor Miles Teller actually did. He has experience as a drummer, so there's no reason to suppose that his musicianship in the film is entirely illusory. But it also seems unlikely that he developed the chops on display after working with a jazz drummer for a few months. Golovich's point is that we cannot know on this evidence how creditworthy Teller is for his musical performance, and the same applies to his acting. From Golovich's perspective, we can only ascertain creditworthiness through classically live performance in which we can witness the musician's ability at first hand. And the same would be true for acting, for example. This question also comes up in the interesting concept of music made with new digital instruments. Some, you know, I, I wrote a piece about this, and I was very interested to discover that there are sort of two camps of musicians who have written about this or kind of reflected out loud about it. Um, and the issue has to do with a concern about the audience's ability essentially to make cause and effect connections between what they see the performer doing and the sound that they hear. Right? So the presumption is if you're using traditional instruments, you see someone press a key, you hear a sound, you figure, okay, that sound was caused by the person pressing a key. Right? But if, you're, if you see someone doing something on a laptop or you know, some other even more exotic kind of digital interface that produces sound, essentially, you know, unless you're very, very familiar with the technology and the way it's being used, uh, you, you have no idea. You have no idea what the relationship is between those two things. And what I was interested to discover was that in terms of musicians who work this way, there are two camps. One for whom this is a problem and a concern, because they, you know, they kind of want to preserve that traditional relationship with the audience while using you know, digital interfaces. And then a whole other group has said basically, fuck them. Right? We don't care. You know? You can't, you can't figure out what I'm doing up here and how it produces sound? Too bad. You know. So anyway, um, so some of them are concerned. Uh, um, and for those who are, uh, creditworthiness has become an issue even in live performance, since the visual information provided to the audience during concerts does not necessarily allow them to assess the musician's skill as it is thought to do with traditional instruments. However, it is clear that most audiences don't really know precisely how, and I say precisely, how sound is produced using traditional instruments either. <clears throat> Unless you play an instrument, you cannot know everything that's involved in playing it, the nuances of the musician's physical interaction with the instrument. Right? So, I mean, we all know this at a very crude level, right? You blow into something, a noise is produced. But if you play a wind instrument, you know you're not just blowing into something. All right? there's, a, there's much, much more complicated than that right? in terms of embouchure, in terms of you know, breath control, and you know, there's a whole many, many dimensions to producing the particular sound. So our belief as a general audience that we can perceive cause and effect relationships when musicians play a traditional instrument is revealed to be another as if. 
Just as we agree to act as if improvisation is taking place, we act as if we understand the precise relationship between a musician's manipulation of an instrument and the resulting sound, and are therefore in a position to assess the musician's creditworthiness. Now, to be fair to Golovich, I should note that he places the ultimate assessment of musical skill in the hands of peer musicians, not those of the general audience. By talking in terms of frames and as ifs, Goffman makes it clear that there is no such thing as unmediated experience. For Goffman, reality itself is a frame, and no understanding or even cognition of experience is possible absent the mediation of a frame to provide an interpretive context. The basic Goffman question is, what is it that is going on here? And he spent his entire career trying to understand how we continually find answers to that question. We do not answer it by uncovering the objective truth of what is happening, but by actively constructing an interpretation of it through interaction, an interpretation that is always mediated, partial, and open to revision. Goffman loved anecdotes. This is one, one of the things that Goffman, I don't know, is often critiqued about, I guess, is his... Um, the fact that most of, the, of his most famous work is not based on field work. Right? Uh, it's based on the collection of anecdotes, essentially. And he had apparently a, an incredible file of stuff that he found in newspapers and magazines or whatever that he would trot out to uh, exemplify his points. So he loved these kinds of little stories, such as a story about a man who seeks to rescue a woman who is apparently being robbed, only to discover that he has wandered onto a movie set and that the woman is an actress playing a woman who is being robbed. Right? Goffman's point is not that the man failed to perceive the truth in the first instance. At the moment he thought the woman was really being robbed, that was the truth. His functional reality, and he acted upon it. When he learned otherwise, a new functional reality replaced that one, but it was not necessarily any true or any more grounded than the first one. For example, the man could have discovered subsequently that although the woman was an actress playing a woman being robbed in a movie, at that moment, she actually was being robbed. Right? <laughs> Truth and reality are what we take them to be on the basis of the information we have at particular points in time and the frames that allow us to interpret that information. As such, they are never objective and fixed, but always subject to revision. In one sense, Goffman's frames are similar to the Cunian scientific paradigms I mentioned at the start of this presentation. One paradigm is not better than its predecessor because it is truer in an objective sense. Right? And one of the points that Kuhn makes, which I, has stayed with me you know, my entire life, uh, is that in order to be able to, in order to, be able to say you know, this one is truer than that, you have to be able to assume a position that's somehow outside the system. And you can look at both of them, you know, a vantage point from which you can objectively assess both claims and the greater truth of one of them. But of course, there is no such position. Uh, one paradigm is not better than its predecessor because it's truer in an objective sense, but because it offers a more persuasive account of available information at the time. In both Kuhn's and Goffman's respective worlds, understandings that function as truths can never be proved false. They can only be discredited. At any point, a new paradigm that offers a still better account could come along. In both cases, interpretation of reality is a potentially infinite process that can never arrive at a definitive, objectively valid understanding. Although Gadamer, in his hermeneutic phenomenology, comes at these questions from a different angle, many of his premises parallel Goffman's. For Gadamer, as for Goffman, understanding is not the uncovering of a truth or reality that is present within a thing or situation, but is always an interpretation of the information before us, which is understood to be partial, possibly inconsistent, and subject to revision in light of new information obtained from further encounters. As Gadamer states more directly than Goffman, quote, understanding is always interpretation, and the discovery of the true meaning, in the case he's talking about, of a text, is never finished, end quote. It is, in fact, an infinite process. Sorry, that was part of the quote. Meaning, uh, Gadamer also sees experience as always mediated, though the nature of this mediation is different for Goffman than for Gadamer. As a sociologist, Goffman was interested in how collectively created social frames shape our individual perceptions and understandings. 
Gadamer agrees with Goffman that we are social beings first and individuals second, but focuses largely on the question of history and how the past can be understood from the standpoint of the present, questions that do not concern Goffman, but are crucially important certainly to my thinking about performance documentation. The two dimensions that media of mediation that Gadamer emphasized are history and what he calls the horizon, the frame of reference reflective of our place in historical time. So the horizon is a frame, in effect, if, you, if you're trying to set these two guys side by side. For Gadamer, our place in history mediates our present experience. Quote, we are always already affected by history. It determines in advance both what seems to us worth inquiring about and what will appear as an object of investigation, end quote. Um, and one of the reasons this was important, one of the specific places where this kind of thing was important to me in terms of uh, talking about performance documentation has to do with an idea that, I mean, I have a quotation from an art critic, but it's a fairly widespread idea that having to do particularly with uh, reenactments of famous historical performances like you know, canonical works of performance art and things like that. Um, the claim that this is a sort of, of a bankrupt idea because those performances can't have the same meaning now as they did then, basically because this is now and that was then. Right? Um, and what Gadamer is suggesting, is, or what he's really arguing against in, in that kind of context, is this idea that there's some kind of rupture between past and present that can't be bridged. Right? That somehow the fact that this happened then makes it meaningless now. Right? Well, we can't, we, well I, should, I should spell this out a little bit more. Meaningless in the sense that we can't, it can't mean the same thing as it once did, and if it can't mean that, then it's not worth doing altogether. Right? Um, and so what Gadamer is saying when he says, uh, we are always already affected by history, it determines in advance what seems to us worth inquiring, he's saying essentially that we are products of history. Therefore, the past is always contained within the present. So there is no, there is no unbridgeable chasm between the two. Right? Um, I mean, it's a little more complicated than that, but that's, you know, that's, that's part of it. Um, uh, okay, so while Gadamer insists that we can never understand the artifacts of the past on their own terms, that is, in relation to a past horizon, we can perceive them only through the frame of our current horizon. He also posits that since we are products of history, the past is not alien to us, but is embedded within our horizon. For Gadamer, it is equally the case that we are products of the past, of history, and that the past is the product of our interpretation of it. In this respect, Gadamer's perception of history is quite different from Kuhn's, whereas aspects of the past are always contained within the present horizon and function as shared premises that make communication between past and present possible. For Kuhn, new paradigms are incommensurable, that is Kuhn's word, incommensurable with their predecessors, and constitute such a radical shift of frame that they re render conversation between past and present impossible rather than enable it. And this is one reason why I took exception to Richard Schechner's talking about the transition from theater studies to performance studies as a paradigm shift. Because if it were, performance studies and theater studies would be incommensurable and incapable of dialogue with one another, which maybe they are, but perhaps not for that reason. <laughs> um, to put it perhaps over simply, Kuhn's understanding of historical, oh, I, I love this, but I'm just going to put it out there. Kuhn's understanding of historical time and interpretation is linear and mostly unidirectional, while Gadamer's is circular. I'm not going to explain it. In my essay, Digital Liveness, which you have and perhaps read, I use Gadamer's thoughts on how we engage with works of art from the past in truth and method as a basis for analyzing how we come to interact with certain digital artifacts as if they were live. As if. See, I snuck that in there. Right? Uh, Gadamer argues not only that the work of art makes a claim upon us, but also that in order to find a work meaningful, we must experience it as contemporaneous, a term borrowed from Kierkegaard that Gadamer construes as meaning, quote, that this particular thing that presents itself to us achieves full presence, no matter however remote its origin may be. Contemporaneity, in this sense, is not a characteristic of the work itself. It is a description of how we choose to engage with it. The work of art must be, exper quote, experienced and taken seriously as present and not as something in a distant past, end quote. 
Gadamer is speaking here, quote, of the temporality of the aesthetic, end quote. The way that works of art from historical context, very distant from ours, may still make claims upon us. I appeal to Gadamer not to frame an argument about digital liveness in relation to historical time. Rather, I am focusing on the aspect of Gadamer's schema that has to do with bridging a gap between self and other by rendering the other familiar. A work of art from a past of which we have no direct experience becomes fully present to us when we grasp it as contemporaneous. I suggest that in order to experience interactive technologies as live, we similarly must be willing to experience and take seriously their claims to liveness and presence. An entity we know, you know like a bot, for example, an entity we know to be technological that makes a claim to being live becomes fully present to us when we grasp it as live. In both cases, we must respect the claim made by the object for the effect to take place. The crucial point is that the effect of full presence that Gadamer describes does not simply happen and is not caused by the artwork or, in my analogy, the technology. Quote, contemporaneity is not a mode of givenness in consciousness but a task for consciousness and an achievement that is demanded of it." End quote. In other words, liveness does not inhere in a technological artifact or its operations any more than it inheres in the performances I discussed earlier. It results from our engagement with and our willingness to bring it into full presence for ourselves. We do not perceive interactive technologies as live because they respond to us in real time. Rather, we perceive real-time response, in some cases, as a demand that concretizes a claim to liveness, a claim that we, the audience, must accept as binding upon us in order for it to be fulfilled. Just as artworks from the past do not simply disclose themselves to us as contemporaneous, but become so only as a conscious achievement on our part, interactive technologies do not disclose them to us, themselves to us as live, but become so only as a conscious achievement on our part. So in other words, I'm trying, you know, in this more recent phase, I guess, to really sh shift the discussion away from, I mean, continue really to shift the discussion away from liveness as residing in the thing we are experiencing and to a position of wanting to argue that liveness resides in our relationship to that thing. Um, and that, re and that, and that that relationship, you know, sort of coming at this from both Gadamer and Goffman, um, is something we have to make happen. Right? It's not built into the uh, performance or the situation. It's not something that the thing we are witnessing forces us to do, or a relationship that it imposes upon us. Rather, uh, but it's it's something that we bring into being through our participation of a certain kind. Um, and, and sort of consciously, or it doesn't have to be consciously, but at any rate, chosen kind. Um, God, in Gadamer's turn, this achievement in the case of an artwork, quote, consists in holding on to the thing in such a way that it becomes contemporaneous, end quote. The expression of holding on is important here, for the way it suggests both conscious activity and precariousness. It is through a willed and fragile act of consciousness that we construe works of art from the past as contemporaneous or interactive technologies as live, an act that must be actively sustained to maintain the engagement on those terms. So the, the part of my wanting to reconcile or parallel Gadamer and Goffman that I haven't, well, I haven't sort of figured out yet, I'm sure there's more than that, but the thing that's on my mind has to do with this idea of a claim, which is a word that bo they both use. Uh, the difference is that basically for Gadamer, being a phenomenologist, anything in the world can make a claim, right? And then the rest of it is how you respond to that. Um, Goffman, of course, was not concerned with anything in the world other than people. So in his world, it's only people making claims. Um, uh, but the rest of it is pretty much the same. I mean, if, if you look at what he says in the presentation of self in everyday life, uh, it ha you know, you, the way you present your, you, through the way you present yourself, you claim to be something, then it's really up to your audience to accept or reject that claim, or to engage with you on that basis or whatever, which is not that different from what Gadamer is saying. But the initial 
source of where those claims can come from is different in the two cases. It's for Goffman, well, I, mean, I don't know what Goffman would have said um, if you asked him, can things other than human beings make claims? Um, too late now to find out. Uh, but it certainly is, uh, um, you know, a, a, uh, um, a difference. And then for that reason, uh, and again, I won't try to explain this fully right now, but for that reason, um, I think that the differences between them might, in a sense, be encapsulated in an idea that the, the exchange between you and another person, for example, in the case of self-presentation in Goffman, um, is cybernetic. It's based on feedback. Okay? Um, whereas in Gadamer, it's a question of dialogue not feedback. And I think there's a big difference between those two things that, that's worth thinking through, even though they both suggest continuous exchange between two different things. Uh, Gadamer's idea that, that our engagement with works of art takes the form of an achievement demanded of consciousness is consistent with his characterization of the audience's position as necessarily active rather than passive. To be part of an audience for Gadamer means to participate rather than simply be there. This parallels Goffman's notion that a spectator is a, so, that spectator is a socially defined role that one plays actively in relation to performance frames. Gottimer defines spectatorship in terms of, quote, devoting one's full attention to the matter at hand, end quote, something of which I remind my students regularly, <laughs> which he describes further as, quote, the spectator's own positive accomplishment, end quote. No one looks at Gadamer as a performance theorist, but there's a lot of stuff in there. In his account, in his account, how we direct our attention is not cued or dictated by the characteristics of the object of our spectator. Rather, it is a response to a claim advanced by the object of our attention and an accomplishment on our part. It is our side of the interaction through which liveness or presence emerges when we are engaging with technologies or perhaps with anything. He insists that it is the audience's active consciousness that allows it to experience the work of art as contemporaneous, which I have extended by analogy to the active consciousness that allows the audience to experience the virtual as live. Okay, so to summarize this argument, some technological artifact, a computer, website, network, or virtual entity, makes a claim on us, its audience, to be considered as live a claim that is concretized as a demand in some aspect of the way it presents itself to us by providing real-time response and interaction or ongoing connection to others, for example. In order for liveness to occur, we, the audience, must accept the claim as binding upon us, take it seriously, and hold on to the object of our consciousness of it in such a way that it becomes live for us. In this analysis, liveness is neither a characteristic of the object nor an effect caused by some aspect of the object, such as its medium, ability to respond in real time, or anthropomorphism. Rather, liveness is an interaction produced through our engagement with the object and our willingness to accept its claim. Well, I realize that I've covered a lot of ground here, and I've moved outward from the fairly concrete circumstances of live performance to more abstract ideas concerning understanding, interpretation, and the constitution of reality. If that's not enough for uh, when, uh, Thursday morning. Then, uh, I suppose my attraction to the ideas I have discussed and the reason why I find them congenial for coming to grips with the elusive phenomena of performance and liveness stems from the idea that they share that reality, whether the reality of liveness or of a performance or anything else, is not simply given, but is constituted through interactions that are contextual in nature and hold out no promise of ever yielding a single definitive understanding. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. All right, I actually am going to take a, I want to ask you a first question. Whoa, <laughs> just executive <laughs> privilege. Exactly, to bring this to the, the, the context, okay. within we, the performance context within which we are Currently, um, okay. so of course, one one thing that is happening here, as I become aware, uh, in particular as the camera moves towards me, is that this <laughs> event is being live streamed yes. by HowlRound. So if you could uh, sort of 
bring your analysis to bear on this situation to help sort of clarify it. And some of the, you know, because uh, I think this very moment uh, brings a lot of the uh, questions you're asking into a really sharp focus. So on the one hand, I'm talking to you right. live. There are all these micro expressions you have that are giving me that reinforcement that you're hearing me and that we're in the same place. Everybody else in this room is experiencing that as they were watching you. They were aware that at any point you could, your eyes could move to them. If they fell asleep, then they might be insulting you. Not that anybody ever would, or if they laughed at something or whatever it was, you'd have that possible feedback. Now, our friends who are watching this, if there are right. any of you, hello. So I'm talking to them right now. I have no <laughs> idea if there's anybody out there. Uh, if you are, how are you experiencing me? How did you experience Phil Ostlander, which you believed was a live presentation? Um, so how would that experience be? And then, of course, we're going to be, you know, how around archives this. So right. in the future, there will be people watching this. Some of the, you know, how is that experience, you know, so the one, first is a live broadcast, as you describe it. The other is a record, is a documentation, right? Right, right. Um, and uh, some of the people watching it will actually be people in this room. So you may watch yourself. Uh, oh, there. Well, never do. I may watch myself. Hello, me, David. How are you doing? Um, <laughs> the people in this room may then. Oh, let's let's review the the experience, right. and then they'll actually experience it through the filter of having been there, which in, ironically might make it feel less live because they're contrasting the experience that they had when it really was live to something that is manifestly different, right. or they might simply relive the experience, reactivate it. So if you could talk about sort of those different uh, phenomenal experiences engaging with the same performance and how they're different and how they're similar. Well, sure. I mean, I, I would guess that, you know, to take the last thing you said, that Goffman at least would argue that, you know, if I am watching a you know, documentation, so to say, of myself, and he pro I, I'm totally guessing here, I'm just sort of speculating, but uh, in terms of, of that sort of idea of the, of the as if, um, I suspect he would say you have to suspend your recollection of the actual event uh, in order to you know, participate with the, uh, the, the documented version of it. Um, uh, you have to be able to treat that somehow as, as your first encounter with, uh, with this stuff. Um, uh, I mean, it's, uh, because otherwise, I suppose you're, um, you know how it ends. You know, you know, you know what's coming up, um, and so you're not really. I mean, it's interesting to sort of think about Gadamer in that context as well. I mean, what is what is that thing he says uh, about what what spectators are supposed to do? Um, let me find it. Um, Devoting one's full attention to the matter at hand. And I suppose the question would be, can you do that? If you are thinking, oh, you know, I was there, I was in that, oh yeah, yeah I remember. You know, then you're not devoting your attention to the matter at hand, <laughs> right? Which is the thing that you're watching. So I think that, at least as far as that goes, in, in, in different ways, both Goffman and Gottimer would suggest that we need to put our, we'd have to put ourselves, you know, assume that sort of frame of consciousness uh, that, that brackets out the earlier experience we have had of this event in order to really attend to the matter at hand in watching the documented version of it. Um, so that would be one thing. Um, I mean, in terms of you know, the audience that may or may not be watching the live stream or the audience of people who aren't here now who may or may not watch it online in, in the future, um, on the one hand, it doesn't seem to me that that situation is terribly different from the BMW Tate live performance room, uh, where in effect, in terms of what you're actually seeing, it's the same. Whether I watch this now or I watch it later, it's the same. The only actual phenomenal difference is, it's not, it's not actually a phenomenal difference. Uh, the only difference is that if I'm watching it now as a live stream, I perceive it as a live stream. Right? Um, and if I watch it later uh, and, and know that it's, it's archived, then I perceive it differently. And that goes back to what I was saying before. And this is something I do believe very strongly that you know, it, uh, the example I was using is live recordings versus studio recordings, but I don't think we listen to those in the same way. I think there are different, you know, so to say, modes of listening. Uh, and so presumably the same thing is true here, that there are different modes of watching or of spectatorship, even though the thing being watched is identical in the two situations. Um, and so then it really becomes a question of framing, which is a lot of what I was talking about in the first part of my article on the tape 
live, BMW, let me in, I mean, take one. <laughs> Performance thing. Um, uh, um, you know, precisely how the website on which they display these things or through which you can access the archive versions frames them, right? Uh, through the way they're presented, through the text that surrounds them, uh, and so on. So it really, you know, it does come down to that. The, the, there's nothing, if you, if you just happened upon, you know, the, the feed of this, absent any kind of information or frame, you would have no idea essentially what you're looking at. You wouldn't know if it was a live thing or if it was a, an archive thing or what, right? So you need the frame to tell you that one way or another. Um, and, uh, and then you need to bring to it the sort of right state of consciousness, as it were, uh, to participate with it meaningfully uh, in the context of how it was framed. Right? Uh, so I, th I think that's this situation in that respect uh, is not uh, particularly different than uh, the Tate Live thing. Um, there was another thought that drifted, I can't remember what it was. Um, I, was, was there another part of this? I may have lost track <laughs> in terms of the, the many layers and there dimensions. Were, exactly. I think you, and then that experience of us in this room is compared to any of that. So, so because you had talked at the very beginning of your talk, you said that the temporality is more important yes. than space. Yes. Um, Seems to But be, then yeah. you also brought in another really important concept, which is interact, interaction. So that, you know, because you can imagine a Skype situation sure. rather than this. So, if, if this was on Skype, you might be able to watch the remote audience. Um, Oh right, and you know, or even if they, if we invited the viewers on Hall around to submit questions afterwards, which would then which the Tay Live thing does do. Yes. So that reinforces, yeah, or, or proves that it's live because they type a question in Twitter or whatever, right, and they respond right, to it. Right. So, uh, so it would be those different. Dimensions. Yeah. Oh yeah. So the other thing I wanted to say, and th this is a little, and this is um, in the in this, the the chapter of liveness that I asked you to read. I I. I Remember, because I read it this morning, that um, there's a section, I think it's talking about improv comedy, in fact, uh, which is sort of talking about the superiority of the live event as opposed to watching on TV or whatever, because of having to do with basically the difference between your ability to, uh, you know, be in the audience and to laugh and whatever, right? But the question, and I, you know, I did talk about this in the book, but I, I will, I'll, I'll say that it's, still kind of an open question in my mind is, um, and again, I'm not going to say that these are the same thing, but I do think that it's not entirely clear to me that you don't get some of that experience from seeing an audience responding to the thing, right? So to the extent that if you're watching improv comedy on TV, let's say, and you can see the audience and the, and the improvisers and the interaction between them, sure, of course, it's not the same thing as if you were sitting among them. Right and and you know could say you know talk back to the prompts that the improvisers give you, um, but but I'm not sure it's completely different either, um, and so that would be another thing that I think would be germane here. That is anybody watching the stream, whether live or archived, would also you know have a sense of audience engagement, assuming that the audience it doesn't really look like the audience is being captured. But if you were, uh, based on the camera angle. Um, but if you were, um, then that would be, that would be provide sort of, in a sense, further framing or you know, a sense of the experience um, to the people watching. That might not be completely divorced from the experience that you are actually having. Here. And of course, that, the bottom line for me would be very simply that all of this said, the thing that I would object to the most personally is an insistence that this event right here is somehow of higher quality than what the people are seeing on the live stream. That's somehow superior to it, it's somehow more real, more authentic, more anything you want. That's where, you know, I start to complain. You, oh, so you use the, the example of uh, Millie Vanilli, and since then, we've become, probably as a culture, less offended by right. what they have done. Is there any, do you see any, uh, any cause for either concern or excitement in the fact that we become less offended by the, the uh, lip syncing and, and uh, 
Well, I, I would resist generalization because at the time, um, at the time I first wrote that, which is a really long time ago now, um, and I was researching it. So two things. One, uh, I was back in the time when I still taught during the summer, which I no longer do, mm -hmm. and I was teaching a freshman class, and I basically asked them, do you care that these people are not really singing? And they said, no, we don't really care. All right? Um, so there's that. And then when I was investigating, because uh, you know, in the wake of Milli Vanilli, uh, people tried to pass various kinds of truth and advertising laws with respect to concerts. If you're going to have lip singing at your concert, you have to say so on the poster. But who was it who was advocating for these laws? It wasn't the kids. It wasn't Milli Vanilli's fans. It was their parents. Right? So this is a generational thing. Always, um, and in fact, I, one of the um, one of the uh, things that I cut out of the first edition of Liveness when I moved to the second edition is the way that chapter, I guess, is chapter two ends, uh, because it, it doesn't end this way anymore. But it ended the first time around on a very specifically generational note, right? And it had to do not with with this question of lip singing, but it had to do with the question of uh, and maybe this is too old-fashioned even now for, for this, but um, it had to do with when you call someone, do you hope to get the answering machine? Um, and, uh, uh, and, and there seemed to be some evidence that that's skewed generationally also, although I personally do hope to get the answering machine. Um, but, so I don't, you know, I don't think there is a we as a culture in this, is what I'm saying. I think you really have to pay attention to the particulars, right? And, you know, if there is evidence, as I believe there is, that even in the, at the high point of the Milli Vanilli, the scandal Milli Vanilli, you know, that, or La Faire, that's what it was, La Faire Milli Vanilli, you know, uh, even at the height of that, their fans actually didn't care, right? Um, then, you know, it's not we as a culture, right? It, and, and why didn't they care? They didn't care because they kind of know that you can't move like that, you can't dance like that, and also sing at the same time. But they want to see both things, have, yeah, they want to hear the sound, they want to see the bodies moving. So if that requires some technological intervention, so be it, right? But it's only old rockists like me, you know, who care about the, the, whether someone's really playing a guitar or not, you know. Um, so I think it is generational, and in that sense, yeah, there is a shift over time, but I don't think it's necessarily a large-scale cultural thing. I think it might... might might be better to think about it in ter more in kind of loosely speaking kind of subcultural terms, right? Because I mean, certainly there are, you know, if you think about rockists as a subculture, you know, we're hanging on to liveness and authenticity and all that stuff as, uh, desperately, right? <laughs> Meanwhile, the Millie and Vanilli fans are blithely going off and saying none of that matters. Yeah. Um, so just, um, just following on from this idea that liveness is produced by kind of an act of interaction with whatever it is, a bot or a this or a that. I'm kind of, you know, it made me think about um, the kind of coercive element of that from the technological point of view coming towards us all the time. And I wondered if Althusser's idea of interpolation is perhaps, you know, part of this story too. And I'm thinking about um, yeah. You know, that, that you don't actually exist until you respond to something that calls your name, and it may call your name in a way that doesn't really work for you, but if you don't respond, you kind of disappear. And I'm just thinking about perhaps a darker side of the way that you're framing sure. liveness, which is, you know, the incredible <coughs> amounts of money and time that have gone into making the interactivity of apps that are constantly tapping us on the shoulder and asking for our attention, you know, so that... Yes, it's, it's a sort of slightly darker view of something that isn't just a conscious act of will, you know, to, to move towards these things. Like, the, the dialogue is very much built into the money-making framework of how these things come to us. You know, like with your right. example of the bot, what, why does right. it keep talking to us in a way that makes us think... Do you see what I'm trying to say? Yeah, yeah, I mean... That, that I mean, we I'll... would actually disappear in a certain respect without responding to these things that have been built to claim our attention. I'm especially thinking of teenagers and Facebook and right. those ways of performing the self, where the implied threat is that the self disappears without giving these pre-programmed Twitch-type responses. Well, first of all, I will say that in the presentation of self in everyday life, which was 
published, well, the book that most, the second version of it that most people know is published in 1959. Goffman already said, you exist only in interaction with others. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I can't remember, the, there's this wonderful line he has, if, you know, if you're, uh, something about if you're, if you're alone in your room, I can't remember the whole thing. But he basically, but basically, I mean, he already was saying, that independent of any kind of technological structure involved, that that is the case. That you you know you 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 exist only uh, in the sense that you uh, exist for other people or in, in the interaction with other people. So I don't I don't think that's a particularly novel or new situation, and I don't know that it is necessarily in itself intrinsically threatening. The second thing I will say, which is going to sound dismissive, and I don't mean it entirely that way, is that. I spent a lot of my time, since I you know, work in popular musicology and various other stuff, talking about art that is also a commodity. And to me, that is simply a given. I, you know, I, don't, I don't even, I'll be very honest with you, I don't even care about commodity critique anymore. It's like, yeah, that's right. You know, that, that's correct. That's the world we live in. But to me, that doesn't then shut down you know, possibilities for thinking about how these things work, how we relate to them, et cetera. So the more interesting response, though, I think would have to do with setting Althusser and Gadamer side by side. Because I think that, you know, certainly in terms of, of how they formulate things, you know, interpolation is not what Gadamer is talking about. Gadamer is talking about dialogue, right? And Gadamer, there's a very, very, very strong um, ethical dimension to Gadamer, uh, which, is, which basically has to do with... Um, you know, there's a kind of responsibility to respond to the claim that something is making while, well, but at the same time, the responsibility is to enter into a dialogue. If there is not a dialogue happening, then that's not, you know, which is what Althusser is saying. Right? So Althusser is not saying, you know, something, and, and I think it's also interesting to think about the difference between hailing and making a claim, right? Um, and, um, uh, and so I think, you know, I, I don't, I don't, I'm not, um, I don't know exactly what to say about it. I just think that um, they, they may in some ways be talking about the same thing, but they're talking about it from very different perspectives. And I guess the question to my <coughs> mind would be, uh, you know, sort of, sort of try to put those two in dialogue, would be kind of, uh, yeah, all right, so if something hails you, you know, do you have to respond? I'm curious, um, two things. Uh, one of the words that I often use to teach um, these articles with is intimacy. And I, so I was following through um, the, the new ways of, of reading what you've written before, and I was curious if, and just, you know, have, has that also followed in? And to take that to, I love this idea of, of how, of the claims of um, the requirement of attention to. And so I'm thinking very much about animation and these animated figures I'm working with. And particularly in Japan, where we have this phenomena of hikikomori, where people just stay inside with the screen. And so I was thinking of that, have, have you thought about how actually intimacy, maybe with this new reading of phenomenology and or attention, also is, needs to be tuned or, or looked further into um, not whether things are live or unlive, or right, right. But, yeah. No, honestly, I haven't. I haven't really focused in on that particular question. But yeah, you're right. It is. It's a good question because I, you know, as far as I had sort of gotten with it, which you know I've already said, and it's kind of obvious, is just to say that, um, you know, to argue against this kind of reflexive assumption that live performances are necessarily more intimate than mm -hmm. recorded ones or whatever. Um, and certainly, you know, I would certainly say that, um, you know, ultimately, intimacy would ha would again be, you know, have to. Well, I think I did say it, but I didn't really expand on. It, would have to do with um, what we experience of the thing rather than the thing itself. But yeah, I think there's a lot more to be said about it. And I haven't, I honestly, I haven't really gone back to that particular dimension. Yeah, I just I love that. And then. 
I'm interested in stuff and things. And one of the things that have things is the big screen in the living room. Oh, yes. The, the, or the little tiny screens and whether that screenness has entered into these claims that we're making on our attention or ways that sort of how that changes interactivity or, yeah. Yeah, I haven't talked a lot about that, but I do talk about that somewhat in the, the, the Tay Modern piece. I was talking about the difference between watching television and, and watching something on a computer and this sort of idea that at least some people have that um, you, you know, the, well, I, the thing I really like, which is not, not my formulation, but I, that I found when I was sort of poking around to write that piece is the, the difference between, uh, I can't quote it exactly, but, you know, the viewer who sits back to watch TV and the viewer who leans forward to use a computer, right? I mean, to me, there's something in that that's really interesting in terms of, thinking about the differences of spectatorship. But I mean, of course, mostly what it had to do with, uh, uh, and certainly this, this is very relevant to the experience. And I mean, of course, it's what's, what other people would call distraction, right? Uh, but this sort of idea that, um, you know, your path, your, your web searching, your path, whatever it is you're doing, is this kind of thing that you construct. Uh, you know, it, it, the, act, the liveness is, is your live activity of selecting what to look at, what links to follow, you know how long to look at something before you go on to something else, you know, all that sort of thing. And that certainly is very, I mean, of course, Gottimer presumably would be in distress here because it, I'm, of course, maybe not. It depends on how you define what the thing at hand is, right? Uh, the thing at hand may not be the performance you're watching, it may be the internet, um, in which case you are attending to it very closely by navigating. Um, but, uh, but it certainly is, that, that is certainly a, a, a key difference and, and, you know, in a sense, if the people at the Tate actually want you to watch these performances, then there's a kind of risk involved, right? Because, I mean, even they give you other links to follow uh, right there, right next to the little screen on the page where you're looking at the performance, right? Um, but, uh, but I do like the, you know, the sitting back versus the leaning in uh, as, a, as an interesting way of encapsulating a kind of difference of posture, of attitude, of, you know, kind of engagement um, that... I don't think it's degree of engagement. I think it's kind of engagement. Mm -hmm. um, uh, well, well, two different types of screens. Lydia? Yeah, I um, have a bunch of questions, but I just want to ask you a little bit about the as if. Um, right. <laughs> there's something about it that's striking me as, um, as a narrow sort of focus. Because if I go to the theater, right, you're talking about Japan. In traditional Japanese theater, everybody knows the story. So they don't go, there, there is no sort of spoiler alert about it. Um, it's the interaction that they're having with the performers most important. Right. Um, and so the as if seems a little problematic in that way. Or is it just a different as if? Okay, so then what would be the as if I, then? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know that kind of theater. Um, then. The, uh, the other part of that then would be if if the per, if the person who's viewing the performance doesn't know the same sort of cultural constructs, right? So if I go to a jazz show, I am I like jazz. I don't really know that you know uh, you're supposed to clap when people finish a solo. Um, my participation in that clap may not be for the same reason. Okay. So how does that then affect the idea that this is uh, a construct that we're all participating in together, if we're not necessarily? OK, well, that's a really good question. Um, and there, it's, it's a relatively complicated question in a sense, because it has to do with, um, especially the last thing you said, participating in it together. If you're talking about Goffman, that's happening in a very particular sense. Because as I said in my presentation without explaining it, for Goffman, frames are social in nature. Okay? In other words, you know, as I say to my students all the time, we don't get to decide what a course is, what a class is, what a class session looks like, and how it operates. Then we have a certain degree of latitude, right? There's a certain degree to which we can define, but, but it's, it's finite, and we know what it is. And it's not of our own choosing, right? But at the same time, we need to have a common understanding of what is going on here or else nothing can happen, 
Right? And that's the part of Goffman that people quickly forget. They, they choose to see what he's saying as restrictive, but in fact, it's enabling. Right? If we do not share a common understanding of what is happening, we can't function together. Right? So that's, I think, a very key point in terms of, of basically understanding Goffman, that you know, the, the frames themselves are socially defined, so they are actually external to us as individuals. But at the same time, they are the very things that allow us as individuals to interact with each other because they provide a common basis for interaction. Right? That said, it is also true that Goffman, um, partly I think by temperament and partly by virtue of being a sociologist, uh, is defining normative cases. Right? So I, like the, even the anecdote I gave you, nothing is stopping you from you know, whispering, there is no baby, before a performance of Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf. There is no Goffman police officer with a pistol sitting next to you, saying you can't do that. Right? So these frames are not coercive. Or maybe they're coercive, actually. They are coercive, sorry, I didn't mean that. They're not determining. Right? They don't determine your behavior, but they provide parameters for your behavior. Right? And you either, and Goffman was fully aware of this, you either, you know, so to say, adhere to those norms or you don't. And if you don't, in many cases, there is a social price to be paid. Mm -hmm. right? And Goffman, the whole idea of frames, understands, allows us to understand how that works. Right? Okay, and then in terms of, you know, sort of audience participation, interaction in a, in a performance, I mean, blithely I would say, it doesn't matter if you, why you applaud the jazz solo. Right? What matters is that you applaud. Um, that's sort of what I was saying in a way when I said, you know, that's the whole idea of the as if. It doesn't matter why you do it. What matters is what you do. Right? So I mean, um, you know, like I said in, in the little presentation, you know, we all behave as if every solo is worthy of applause. And so we applaud it. Right? Now, privately, I may be thinking, oh my God, that was the worst solo I've ever heard. And the person sitting next to me may be thinking, yeah, wow, that was great. Right? It doesn't matter. In terms of participation in the event, what matters is that we applaud. I'll give you another little anecdote, right? something I heard on NPR years ago, which I thought was very illuminating, which was from the British comedian Eddie Izzard. And he was talking about an audience at a comedy show. And the sort of hypothetical situation is, comedian says something, everyone's laughing and applauding, one person turns to another, <laughs> what did he just say? <laughs> right? So the reason you're laughing and applauding is not necessarily because of what the comedian said. It has to do with your participation in the social event around you. And if everyone else is laughing, right. Right, you know, again, it comes down to, in a sense, either you laugh or... You don't laugh, and then other people look at you and say, why aren't you laughing? The guy's really funny, right? Um, so I think what Bogoffman is doing primarily, really, is giving us a vocabulary for talking about these things, right? Um, and to sort of, you know, understand that the, you know, frames are not determining, but they are, they, they provide definitions, right? Normative definitions for what is supposed to be happening here. And then the question of how individuals make choices within that socially determined frame, that's wide open. I mean, one of the things that a lot of people also don't necessarily know or in a sense understand about Goffman, as opposed to other sociologists of the time, there was another sort of branch of sociology, which, which actually still exists in a different, that's it's kind of taken a specific direction, um, who were interested in what are called social scripts. And Goffman was very insistent that human behavior is not scripted, right? I mean, to him, interestingly enough, human behavior was much more improvised within parameters, much the way jazz is. Um, that, you know, if you know the frame, you kind of know what you're supposed to do. But that doesn't give you a script. It doesn't give you a set of specific things you should do or say in a sequence in which to do or say them. You kind of feel that out as you're going through, right? That's why I said, you know, cybernetic and feedback. Because the other thing, of course, the reason why Goffman calls the presentation of self impression management is because it's an ongoing process, always. So that I have, you know, his idea is that I have the desire for you to perceive me in a certain way, 
All right? So I present myself to you in a way that I think is going to make you perceive me in that way. But what if I get the sense that it's not working? All right? Through feedback, through whatever it is I pick up, whatever cues you know, I, I get from you. All right? Then I'm going to change. I'm going to adjust. I'm going to, if I can, I'm going to try to you know, do something a little different or speak a little louder or you know, whatever it might be. Uh, to try to try to get back on track, try to get back to a place where I feel that you are perceiving me the way I wish for you to perceive me, all right? So, so it's not at all scripted um, uh, in that sense, but but it is, you know, there are always, according to Goffman, um, conventions, for lack of a better term, uh, social conventions surrounding uh, of which we with which we are all familiar, right? And obviously, if you're not familiar with them, to go back to you know, sort of question of if, what if you're in a different cultural situation, I mean, you know, then you're subject to ridicule in some cases. I'm sorry, but it's true. Like the person who doesn't know when to clap at a classical music concert. Right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, thank you very much. This was really thought-provoking, um, and I, I I'd like to actually pull on this thread a little bit and talk about uh, the politics of the frame um, because uh, uh, the, the phenomenological approach gives us this, um, what I think is an enhanced sense of agency. And so, uh, especially to what you're saying here, I'd like to push back a little bit on the fact that um, the choice that you make on these social frames is wide open. Uh, where I, I, I disagree with that in the sense that it, there are consequences that go far beyond ridicule, right, in a social situation. Um, and I was just wondering if you could talk about sort of the political nature of, of power structures that influence our choices uh, with, and how that affects the, sure. the encounter. Well, I mean, I think to me the most, the most important and, and in a sense obvious issue, I mean, this is not something that Goffman really talked about, but uh, where you know the whole idea of framing intersects with power is in the choice and definition of frames. Uh, you know, I mean, I mean, I say this to my students all the time. You know, our classroom encounter is framed in a certain way as a classroom encounter. We all know what that means, right? It means that you are not free to come in here naked, you know, without consequences. You're not free to hang from the ceiling and shriek like a bat. All right? That's not, a, that's not a way of participating in this frame. You are also not free to redefine the frame to any extent, but I am. All right? I mean, so I can say, all right, today put your chairs in a circle. And you have to do it. All right? So that, to me, is, that's the real question of, with respect to frames and power, is who has the power to decide not so much how things are framed, but what the definition of the frame is at any given point in time. So for example, it's important to understand that Goffman does not argue that frames are static. Right? So one of the examples he gives, um, <laughs> which is sort of a typically morbid example, is of you know, uh, capital, capital punishment, execution. So you know, what did an execution look like in, in the day of a tale of two cities? Right? 18th century. What does it look like today? Very different. You know, today it's a private event, it occurs at midnight, it's witnessed by very few people, you know, as opposed to being in the public square where people bring their lunch, it's in the middle of the day, you know. Um, but we, so we still have a frame, an event frame that's called execution, right? But what that means is completely different now than it used to be. So the question is who gets to determine that meaning? Who gets to determine what that frame actually is and what the roles that are available in it are, right? That's where the power is in all this, it seems to me. Uh, and that's where, you know, because I mean, frames in and of themselves, I don't think are either malign or beneficent. They are simply means, I mean, frankly, if you, if you accept what Goffman says, human cognition is impossible without them. So therefore, you know, we, ha we have to have them, right? Otherwise, the world is just, you know, buzzing in colors, right? Um, so, so that in and of itself is, you know, that's neither good nor bad, it's just what, it just is. Right, so to me the question then really in terms of thinking about it in terms of power and power structures and so on has to do with, you know, again, not particularly, not maybe not necessarily how, if, well, this, this may be a little bit too technical, but, you know, how a situation is framed kind of initially because that's 
by social definition. But then, of course, within that, you know, I could, another example I use with my students is, you know, I could say, all right, people, I don't feel like teaching today, but I brought you some pizza, I brought you some party hats, I brought you some stuff to drink, we're going to have a party. I'm reframing this as it's no longer a classroom session, it's now a party, and I have the power to do that. I do it too many times, the administration might take notice, and then they have the power to tell me that I don't have the power to do that. Right? And so on and so on. But that's, to me, where, you know, the choice, where, who gets to choose the frames, and, and in, in instances where things, where a frame can be chosen, such as today it's party, not class, who gets to do that? Who has the power to do that? And how do they exercise it? Right? And then the second point would be the definition of the frames. Right? Who gets, to, who, how are, how are uh, the, yeah, you know, well, I mean, if, from a historical standpoint, how did it come to pass that executions that were once public events no longer are, right? How did that happen? How, who, what, what, who was involved in that? What set of decisions led to that, right? How, you know, et cetera. So that, to me, is where those kinds of questions, those two places, is where those kinds of questions really come, uh, come up. And, 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 and again, to me, you know, the, the, the vocabulary frames gives you a way of talking about it. So um, I'm interested, I, I love this idea of, of, the, of the way that the mediated experience, of course, phenomenologically, can become live depending on how we perceive it. And I'm thinking about when it's recorded, so uh, recorded media in which the technology of, of record, like the, that piece, is itself cl more clearly bound by it than morality. So an example would be like a wax cylinder. And how, like, listening to that, first of all, it's harder, especially for us now, to, if you listen to one, to yeah. imagine that this is live in the same way that's like a CD. But at the same time, the experience of listening to that gains its own liveness by its ephemerality. And so the question of listening to the wax cylinder played on the um, phonograph versus the uh, listening to a wax cylinder played through YouTube. And I was wondering if so it could extend to this kind of will post human through place, like through another frame, if that makes sense. Hey, you lost me in this. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> I lost me too. Of course, um, the word remediation came immediately into my head. Yeah, but I mean, yeah, basically, so that the, uh, so another example would be like, so the, the, the howl round, right? So that people watching at home or people watching later on can, then it becomes live for them, even if it's later on, because right. of the interactivity of it. That it, it gets one of these frames that we assign to liveness. Um, and if I'm understanding right, and maybe I'm not, uh, ephemerality could be one of those frames. Like interactivity, yes, but the idea that something feels that way, feels well, um, limited. I'm not sure I would choose to say that ephemerality is a frame exactly, but what, what do you mean by ephemerality in this context? I mean the sense that what you're experiencing cannot be experienced in the way you're experiencing it for very long. So, um, like before we started, you know, transferring right. wax cylinders to like other like right, material right, on them, right. the listening to the wax cylinder as it starts, the, the cylinder itself starts to crumble, is that experience of listening a kind of, a different kind of liveness that's like another step out from, now you're listening to the cylinder itself perform. And it's dying. <laughs> there are other people you should be asking this question. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, I mean, I, I'm not. I'm still not exactly sure what the question is, but certainly I would agree that, and, and it does, I guess, in a sense, it does become a sort of question of framing. Like if someone says to me, "Here, listen to this," and I listen to it, I go, "Okay." And they say, okay, listen to this. I'm going to play you a wax cylinder, and this is probably the last time we can play this cylinder. So you're never going to be able to hear this again. Of course I'm going to hear it differently. Right? I, I can't, you know, just sitting here define or explain exactly what the differences are going to be. You know, what, what that means ultimately in terms of how I'm going to listen to it differently. But certainly I would. And that, and that is purely a matter of framing. You know, sort of how the experience of, of playing this thing is or is not framed, right? Um, and, and certainly, you know, if, 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 uh, 
uh, if someone, yeah, if someone were to say to me, you know, this is, even though this is a recording, this is the only time that this recording can be played or something like that, then yeah, of course, that would make a, a tremendous difference in how I would attend to it. Um, but again, that's, that's, you know, that's purely, I mean, in a way, I, sort of, well, yeah, purely a matter of how the experience is framed and consequently what my understanding of what the experience is, is. Yes? Mike. Mike, yeah. Thanks, this is great. I, I want, before I ask my question, uh, I want to thank you for acknowledging the experience of looking back over past writings <laughs> and saying, wow, I wrote this, but who wrote this? That's, that's yeah. been my experience. Um, I was wondering if we could talk a little bit more about uh, the terms that you're using recently. Uh, contemporaneity has been one today. Intimacy um, in some of the yeah, things okay. read, yeah. So both of those terms are about closing distance. Yes. Okay. Um, and what I'm wondering about is where do we put into this thinking uh, artists or, or works that really want us to be aware of the machinery of that closing? Uh, and I'm thinking, uh, for example, uh, Brecht, I'm thinking Jack Smith, I'm thinking Susan Laurie Parks. I'm also thinking of uh, game, both board game and video game designers that really want us to experience a moment of sort of play, of flow, which is its own kind of intimate um, experience, mm -hmm. and then suddenly draw us up against the machinery, the ideology, uh, the stuff, the media that, that's enabling that. So Brenda Romero is a fantastic game designer. She has a game called Train. And it's, a, it's a, about getting pieces, getting these little pieces onto a train car. You're trying to do it as efficiently as possible. And at some point during the game, it's revealed to you that you're actually playing a Holocaust game. Mm -hmm. And the pieces are Jews, and these things are train cars. And so you're suddenly made aware of, whoa, I was having a kind of fun here and intimacy with the mechanics of the game with my fellow players, and bang, I'm in an historical space, an institutional space, and so on. So if, you, if, I'm, if this doesn't seem too obdurate, right, or obtuse, um, can you speak about where, does, where do we put, uh, or maybe is there a place for thinking about, maybe in a more anxious or nervous way, about that closing of distance where we're not valuing intimacy, we're not valuing that experience of contemporaneity with an, with an older work or a work that's coming from a different space. Okay, well I don't think you can conflate contemporaneity with intimacy because I don't think it's at all the same thing. I'm not, and I would want to do Contemporaneity that. simply has to do with positioning something from the past so that it is meaningful to us now, right? And one of the, um, I mean first of all, Gadamer believed that that is, is necessary. Uh, in order to have any kind of engagement with things from the past. He also, um, when you get a, just one level down deeper into what he was saying, he also does not believe necessarily that this is possible with every artifact from the past, that there are simply things that no longer have any meaning to us. Right? Um, and I, I wish I could quote this dir directly because it's actually one of my favorite passages from him, but he says something like, you know, only that part of the past, which is not past, is available to history. Right? Um, so it's only the part of the past that's still in the present. Um, and so if you're talking about the kind, well, anything, but the kinds of things that you're talking about in the context of contemporaneity, then you are talking about, for example, things from the past. Right? And Gadamer's and our engagement with them. Um, so, for example, Brecht might be an interesting case in this instance. Um, and because, again, you know, the other, the other major concept, well, major phenomenological concept, but certainly with Gadamer, is this idea of a horizon. Um, and part of his point is that, you know, we can't, we can't experience things from the past in the, through the horizon under which they were created because that's gone. The only, the only way we can experience them is in relation to our own horizon, right? Which means that the only meaning things have for us is the meaning that they have for us now, 
right? Um, so this is a sort of roundabout way, I guess, of asking, well, okay, if we sort of think that through, what happens to something like Brecht? To what extent are the effects you're talking about uh, specific to a particular horizon? Right? This effect works now. Will it, necessarily, you know, will it necessarily work for people looking back at it, you know, engaging with it by bridging that distance by making it contemporaneous, but still only able to perceive it in terms of their own horizon? You understand know what I'm saying? Um, because it seems to me that what you're talking about are kind of, you know, I, I mean, I would say effects in a way. Um, and those effects may be somewhat specific to how people perceive under a particular horizon. It's not quite what I'm thinking about. I, I actually think I'm, I'm thinking more about works that have inbuilt into them these, right, we might call them an alienation effect, or right, we might sure. talk about a modernist idea of burying the device. These moments where, where Nikki Giovanni has a poem, her most famous, Nikki Rosa. She spends the first part of the poem telling you in, in really striking, uh, inviting ways about her childhood experience, uh, growing up poor and black. And then right at the end she says, and I hope no white person ever writes about this, I'm a white person. So I've been brought in and then suddenly I'm told, everything right. I just told you, in fact, this invitation into intimacy, to use a term, uh, has, is you're not there. So it's, it's, I'm thinking about those kinds of things where it's part of the work itself, maybe a horizon of expectations, where we're not allowed to, to, to think about that contemporaneity. It's, it's, and it's not, it's not a question merely of horizons, but of the structure of the work itself. I, I, honestly, I don't think that the not allowed is a thing. I mean, I mean not, from, not from phenomenological perspective. I mean, I mean, it would only be, again, from, and again, I have to say, it has to be, if you, if you really want to talk about it in these terms, it has to be our engagement with things from the past, right? How far back in the past, I don't know. But it has, you know, that's, that's the point that, that, that's what Gadamer is trying to talk about, is how we can possibly, you know, some caveman somewhere made a painting, right? How can we now, today, possibly get anything from that, right? Anything. How can we possibly engage with it, understand it? How does that, and not it doesn't happen, but how does it happen when it happens? Right, that's what he's trying to get to, um, and um, and the other thing I would say is, is it's you know I was I was recently um, uh, rereading uh, one of Bert States' essays on uh, I guess it's the act or phenomenology of acting or something, which is this really weird essay where the first part is this fairly straightforward kind of account of three different modes of acting and blah blah blah. And then it sort of takes off into this fairly lengthy discussion of what I would call basically, I don't think he, that's the word terminology he uses, but sort of conventions and how you know, certain kinds of artistic gestures are, are fresh and then become stale through reuse, etc. And so I kind of wonder about the sorts of things you're talking about. I mean, isn't that sort of stuff that we become kind of familiar with at a certain point? And you go, oh yeah, okay, I see what she's doing here. So, so, and the reason I'm asking that is because if we're talking Gadamer, we're talking historical time, right? And over historical time, if enough artists have done this kind of gotcha gesture, then it's by, the by the time it reaches us, it's kind of like, yeah, yeah, that's so 1980s. You understand what I'm saying? So I, so I just, you know, so I don't, I'm not, eh, I don't, I'm not quite sure how this, you know, how to use this kind of framework for talking about what you seem to want to talk about. So we're at about 12, 15, if somebody has a really burning question that, that you that are dying to ask right now, then we have one more question. <laughs> we are going to have three hours more of discussing with, with Phil. Just a quick there, yeah, okay. So how, how much of this is connected like socially and this, and this feeling of connectedness? And I'll give you an example. So um, I would prefer to listen to the radio because I feel like it is it's live and I'm connected because other people are listening to it right then. Whereas right. it could be the same well, song. Or at least you think they are. At least I think they are. Right. But it could be the same song on the radio that I could just stick a CD in and listen to. Oh, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> but that idea, or a live telecast, you know? Well, I don't want to watch that tomorrow tape because everybody else is watching right, it sure. tonight. <coughs> well, 
I, is yes. That, you know, <laughs> like, is that a frame? Is that, you know, am I making that frame that, you know, well, it is more Oh, yeah, of course. I mean, if, if something is, is uh, yeah, again, okay, it goes, for example, the Tate Modern thing. I mean, if something's framed as a live stream, you know, which we are sending out across the world. It's available. It's sending out is not the right term here, but with radio it is. Yeah, that, that's, we're sending out or it's available to lots of people. Um, then that's how it's been framed for you. Yes, absolutely. And that's your understanding of what's going on, and that enables you then to participate in that way. I will go, you maybe one better, or maybe it's just, because I'm not, I, especially with the parlous state of the radio industry today, there is no guarantee that anyone else is listening. Um, uh, and also, as someone who has been on the radio, it's actually really interesting from the other end, because yeah. you're sitting behind a microphone talking, and you have no idea if there's anyone out there listening. Right. Right. It's a very, from the performance side, it's a very strange uh, thing. But um, there are certain songs, not, not because I feel that other people are listening, but there are certain songs that I only want to hear on the radio. I, I, you know, I, don't, I don't want, I want to just sort of come upon them, right? Yeah. Um, and, and, and experience them that way, and whether I own recordings of them or not, I don't want to listen to them that way. I want to turn on, well, Bernadette by the Four Tops is one of these. So I want to turn on the radio and there's Bernadette. You know, I, I don't want to listen to Bernard at home. I don't know why, but it's just, you know, it's just something about that. You know. All right, let's crush the frame of the lecture and move on to the lunch frame. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so, uh, so, uh, so, uh, so, uh, our dinner, so just come up here and we'll